Let's now talk about collision detection and collision response. The physics engine must provide a way to respond to collision as it is detected. This is also part of the constrained motion. For our case, uh, our collision is quite trivial, our collision detection, because it is just a matter to do a point inside the sphere test. And it is done so by simply checking the distance between the point and the center of the sphere. If it is less than its radius, we are inside, else we are outside. And the points will be the vertices of the cloth. This may also give you a clue why I choose a sphere to exemplify collision detection and response, because it's extremely easy. Geometric intersection between points, rays, and spheres require very simple mathematics to evaluate those intersections. One thing, however, I need to warn you is that our simple method only works if the patches of our cloth are smaller than the sphere, because if they get bigger, it will fly through. And let me bring my pen here, and let me see if I can show you the problem. Let's say those are the vertices of the cloth, and let's say these points are flying uh, yeah, towards the sphere all away, and I'll try to draw a straight line. It didn't get very straight, but so you can see it will fly through. The, the collision with this scheme will not be detected. Yeah, let me erase this, bring my laser. But you can see with collision with more complex objects, uh, complex uh, shapes, it can get far more involved. And this is why some physics engines prefer to use external libraries for collision detection, because collision detection is a whole subject in itself, as I said earlier. But if you want to learn more about the various types of common collision detection algorithms used in physics and graphics engines, there are many great books and online resources resource just dedicated to this subject. One that I really like, and I will just quickly, uh, briefly mention here, is the real-time rendering books companions website where the authors compile common intersection methods and links to the original authors papers and some of them have source code and I'm just gonna quickly bring uh, their website and by, by, by the way this is a great book you must have if you're doing either physics or graphics uh, programming so in here they compile they put in like a matrix scheme all sorts of types of intersections. So you can do ray and ray, ray and plane, ray and sphere, ray and cylinder. So simple uh, algorithms like ray and ray, they're just colliding two lines basically. But then if you want to see far more complicated objects like convex polyhedron against a convex polyhedron, kind of goes to the same place, but here's the collision. One collision detection was developed by this guy, and if you click on sometimes it takes you the, to an up-to-date link, and this is the source code, and you can tell this is far more complicated to do like our, the simple collision detection we did, and you can spend quite a bit of time understanding all the, the nuances of the algorithm he developed. But anyway, this is a great um, resource, so I'm just going to leave it here so you can take a look later. Once we detect the collision, for the collision response, we're going to use projection to resolve it realistically. So we wanted the cloth vertices to slide across the sphere surface as it collides with it. To do so, we want to use the sphere surface normal, which is the vector perpendicular to the, uh, the sphere surface. However, there can be infinite uh, surface normals, right? Because this is one normal, another normal could be here. So which one do we pick? So we want to use the sphere center in the point that penetrated the sphere as base to calculate the surface normal. So by looking here at the picture, once you have uh, the, the surface normal vector and what the way we're going to do it is basically this we're going to get the p prime minus the center of the sphere and you normalize this and then once you have that you just offset the 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 the, the, the sphere center by the surface normal by ex the precise size of the radius and that will bring the point right at the surface so we are projecting right here 
and, and this will give you the, the realistic uh, result uh, as the points is like across the sphere. So in our case, P prime is where the point will be at when we resolve that collision. And one interesting thing here is that with the Verlet integrator, as uh, Thomas pointed out, the final position, the P double prime, in the previous position, uh, bef before collide the sphere, is all what's needed to calculate the next integration step. In other words, there's no need to handle velocity changes. This is done like automatically. So because of the, how the Verlet works using just positions and not velocities. And you can also use the same idea to project points back to other object surface. Assume you have all ways to calculate that surface normal. Projected can, projecting can be used in the, same, in the same fashion. For example, if you don't want the cloth to go underneath the ground, and let's say the ground is y equals zero, you can simply adjust the y coordinate of the point that penetrated the sphere to be equal zero, p prime in our case, and you don't fix the x and z position of p prime. And that way you're basically projecting p prime back to the surface with the correct slide and you'll be right here where p double prime is. So as a quick side note, and when two uh, moving objects collide in physics engines, at the point of collision, there exists a tangent plane between these two objects. And the normal to that plane is called contact normal. And it is usually calculated from the first object's perspective. In our case, the contact normal here, if PA and PB are the center of mass of these objects, that will how you calculate the contact normal. And in, in this case, but in our case, since we are not really colliding two more objects, we are just testing collision of a particle with a static wall, a static object in this case, uh, the contact normal is equivalent to the surface normal. Let's now implement the collision uh, detection response into a particle system and you'll be part of the solver because that's where we're going to solve this uh, motion constraint. And it's basically just another constraint that we're going to add in here to show the power of relaxation, how simple it is. So let me mark this loop because we can keep adding different constraints, constraints in here. So the way I'm going to do is basically the same way. So I'll build a little bit slowly. And um, so I already have worked the code, but let's just go slowly, slowly. So we're going to set, we are going to satisfy another constraint and then I'm going to call the sphere constraint. So we're basically going to loop through all the particles and we first will calculate the contact normal the way we saw it into the slides because we want to bring our point we project back to the surface of the sphere. So basically we have the radius is 0 0.5 because if you remember we created the sphere as one unit for the diameter so it's got a 0 0.5 radius and that's the sphere center is hard coding here. Um, and this bias is I added so I made the sphere radius slightly bigger than it is actually and the reason is because since we're drawing lines and the lines can start having a Z fight when they touch the surface of the sphere. So I made a little bit just so we can see the lines a little more clearly. And, and then basically what the contact normal, if you remember, is really the P, the, the point that's now, the, it's, uh, that might be inside the sphere, we don't know yet, minus uh, the center of the sphere. And from that, we compute this is just the vector, right? The contact number in the length of this vector will be really the distance we are, we are looking for this delta length. So if this is less than the sphere radius, so at this point is inside, we have collision. Now we collide. So we have to do something about it. And then basically now I normalize because it's the same distance. And then I project back using 
that formula we discussed, which is a center a few times, plus the contact normal scale by its radius. And that would take care of the collision detection and the response. And this is inside the, the constraint solver because this is another constraint, it's another motion constraint. And right now, if we run, we already, we should be able to see already the, the collision detection response happening. See now, it starts to look a lot more realistic. So the cloth now collides with the sphere realistically and you will eventually settle. But in fact, you will never completely settle because there's always a little bit of motion. And, but it is definitely colliding and, and behaving quite realistic. And let's then continue with a few other modifications. Um, so now, just to add a little more animation to this and make it a little nicer to, to see or to test, even to test the motion, I will, I create another public interface in here that gives me the, the pointer to the edge constraint where the, the cloth is constrained right there with spin to that line. And so inside our update function here, right here, I will do a little bit of animation with the edge. And basically, the only, the only, the, what where I'm going to do is move the edge back and forth before we update. So it's nothing really that interesting here. I just get the pointer from the edge and then I loop to that dimension and I just add, uh, to, I just add an offset to the Z value. So we can probably now fix the camera. I don't know, I'm gonna make it a little farther down so we can probably see better to see it better and now the edge will be moving and we can see the collision detection response a lot better. See now I'm just moving the entire cloth and then it collides with the sphere and it slides and the patches are definitely smaller than the sphere radius so the collision should always work so we will we'll never fly through. And then it's getting now pretty close to simulating the the real cloth and it's looking now quite perfect there are a few minor things you can adjust the dispatches we can use different configurations they don't bend that much like we can put more uh, strain into the cloth but that's basically the idea here and i want to also discuss a um, few other things one thing that's important and i do this on purpose on purpose um, you see i add all these constraints inside the relaxation loop the truth of the matter is like as far as optimization goes this uh, edge constraint could even go outside so it make it, it goes a little fast because we are basically just spinning the entire line to an edge that moves so even before it goes into the relaxation, all these points are completely fixed right there. So it won't really matter if I put this inside the, the, the relaxation or not. It's certainly better to put inside as far as it gets more mathematically correct. But these points are completely pinned. We don't really need. So that doesn't change anything if I do that. And I will show you. So see, it's just working exactly the way it was before because there's no really collision with the edge and the edge is totally pinned. So we're just basically fixing the points. So we can start optimizing two things in here. However, when, then you, you may think, okay, maybe I can do the same thing with the sphere constraint. Yes and no, and depends on the case. This, I'm just gonna move this outside of the relaxation loop and when we try to run this so you it looks like it's just fine it's just work oh maybe I don't really need to worry about 
uh, adding all these constraints I can optimize yeah in certain cases you can but the only reason this is working right now because the cloth is not that stiff and there are not a lot of forces working on it but remember the relaxation will try to find a solution for this so what happens the moment and then let me launch let me show you what I'm going what's gonna happen well now let's make the cloth a lot stiffer and and then I will also increase the gravity quite a bit let's make it eight so it, the cloth now is heavier and stiffer and this the contact resolution here the 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 collision response here is totally outside the loop so what's gonna happen is like the the solver will will definitely resolve the constraint solver for the cloth the patch so we make it move realistic but some of these points what happens they, they might be inside the sphere and because you are not inside the constraint solver they actually might fly through even though it, they will definitely collide because you are not trying to solve both constraints at the same time you're just solving one and let it go the other one and this let's see what happens here because that's kind of all these bugs you start running into physics engines and you just don't know why so now it sees the class is a lot heavier and a lot stiffer so it looks like uh, it was going to work but I don't know if you saw but it will happen again many times so the constraint solver is pushing the, the, the points inside the sphere because w you are not really colliding with the sphere properly and it, 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 it found a solution but it doesn't really care so it, then it flew through even though literally these patches are far smaller than the sphere they are making it go through so which is not correct so it's important depending on the type of simulation you need to understand exactly what's going to be inside the constraint solver what's not going to be inside the constraint solver and and this takes a lot of tuning too and and it's really a problem specific one fundamental thing we are missing in our cloth demo is illumination. Most scenes in 3D graphics are illuminated by some sort of lighting algorithm. And most uh, lighting algorithm requires a, a vertex or face normal to compute the proper polygon shading. For our cloth, this is even more critical because we need to see the curves as it moves realistically. Otherwise, it will look like some strange blob of triangles. With rigid bodies, we can pre-store our vertex and face normals and transform its coordinates inside the shader. But this is not the case here, my friend. We have no ways to pre-compute any vertex normal because our cloth is morphing constant and in a non-predictable way. So the standard way of doing this is it would be the same as you, you would with a pre-baked 3D model. But you have to do it frame. Basically, you just loop through all the triangles that are connected to a vertex, compute each face normal, add them all together, and find a normalized result, which is indeed the average shared vertex normal between these faces. And the pseudocode shows here how it's done. I assume you have just triangles, and I assume you have a vertex and an index array. And this vertex array has the, 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 the normal and the the position you basically look through the face index, get the face, and then you get the edges, and you do a cross product to compute the face normal, and then you add all these face normals back to the vertex normal, and then finally, then you loop it again, you normalize everything, and that will give you the average vertex uh, normal for for all the 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 shared faces. So I'm not going to implement lighting in our demo because it's too much part of the render and I have to create new shaders and different lighting models. And I want to keep the code as, as, as simple as possible. So I will not do it. But I just to let you know, if you want to make a more elaborate demo with lighting, you need the vertex normal and they must be computed dynamically and at each frame. Optimizations. I want to talk about optimizations because uh, soft body simulation is expensive computationally. 
so as you may have noticed. So the key to improve performance in our keys here is to use parallel programming. But when we talk about parallel programming, there are different levels of it. There's parallelism at the program level, at the algorithm level, or at the instruction level. At the programming level, we would be doing multi-threading or multi-processing, which won't help much in our case. At the algorithm level, which is certainly very, very powerful here, you can try to break the problem into smaller units and have each of them processed in parallel and combine the results later like in divide and conquer. You may also need to do a different data arrangement to make it easier to parallelize the algorithm and so on. In this case, you can take advantage of the GP, GPU programming, which is the general purpose computing and graphics processing units, <laughs> pretty fancy name, and use uh, APIs like CUDA or OpenCL. Finally, you can implement parallelism at the instruction level. And for that, you can use the SIMD instructions, which stands for single instruction multiple data, or type assembly directly and try to do a better instruction scheduling than the compiler, which is usually pretty difficult. Here, I will just briefly mention some SIMD uh, implementations you can do since they are really straightforward. But if you really want to uh, get the best performance using SIMD instructions, I highly recommend you check out an article I wrote some years ago when I was really digging into this subject quite a bit and it's called Design Fast Cross-Platform SIMD Vector Live. It's published on Gamma Sutra and I put the link in here. If you just search for it, it should take you there. And even after many years later, all the things I discussed there are still valid in all the platforms that provide vector SIMD instructions. So, Check it out for more details on SIMD programming. Code cleanups. Our simple demo can be improved in many areas. As I modified the original sample code from Microsoft to morph it into our cloth demo, I have made many bad choices, mostly for clarity and to make the presentation as short as I could, as I mentioned a few times but also for you to look at Thomas's code and follow very easily these modifications if you'd like. Since I use most of his pseudocode as is and just adapt it to the, a different render. In our case, here's a list of some of the cleanups. Definitely the memory leaks we never fixed and also overall bare architecture. So why couldn't you create a base class instead of repeating that code twice for the different objects? That way I can also avoid loading the same shader to eyes. I can I could avoid change the, the 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 many render states useless render state changes we do that definitely cause hit on the GPU and that double memory cover could combine those structures to point the particle system and the render and the list can go on and on. There are many things that could be improved. And I will here I will just probably address just the memory leaks and the rest I'm going to leave as this because improving this demo architecture will be beyond the scope of this presentation which is just the basics of physics programming. Let's now address some of the items we discussed in the slides. The first thing I, I briefly mentioned, I'll talk again, is this double memory cop could be totally avoided. So if you look at the clot versus, it, it, this array has the position of the particles in the clot and is repeating the, inside the particle system. You could combine them just one piece of memory and get rid of the memory copy. I won't do this here because I want to keep the code as close as possible as from Thomas' uh, original article. But to let you know, this is definitely unnecessary. However, we never really clean the clot versus. I would just... Uh, uh, clean right here, app shutdown. And the reason I need to clean this because, again, we are copying this from CPU to GPU memory every frame. So this buffer needs to, to hang around. However, the class indices, which we are located here, they are static. Once they're in GPU memory, we don't really need them anymore. So I can just um, delete the the class index right there because we really don't need them. And also for the particle system, we allocate the constraints, but we never clean them. So let me just uh, 
destroy them into the destructor you could create a destroy function release whatever uh, I would just clean them up into the destructor when the app shut down the the stick constraints are, are gone so I just did I just loop to the STL vector delete everything and then clear the vector so this is just regular maintenance nothing really uh, interesting but one thing I want to talk about more truly is the SIMD opti optimizations so when I decide to pick the Verlet integration step because it can show very well the some of the optimizations you can start doing to make this go a lot faster one thing I'm going to do here it's def it's compiled but in release mode let's build this code and quickly take a look at the generator assembly with its steps so here I will just go to the disassembly and then we can see and I will copy the function all the way to the return right here where it ends one thing is already interesting the compiler is already using this XMM0 those are the MMX regs, those are high performance and it's already trying to use the SIMD instructions and these are SIMD instructions, these are uh, vector instructions it's pretty impressive it's already doing that in the past you would use the ST0, ST1 which is the floating point regs and the code, the generic code would be much 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 smaller, much bigger and, and it will run much slower but anyway so I'm just going to bring uh, notepad in here paste that code and remove the C you can uh, inspect the assembly without the C code I like to look at as I try to optimize this so I know what things what is happening how the compiler is generating the code so I'm just getting the rid of the C code we can see just the function and I will bring Excel to help me here so here's our Verlet step so it's roughly what 16 instructions to perform the Verlet step so now instead of uh, using the SM float I'm gonna write the code to be more friendly to the compiler and in here is the version I worked out which is quite identical but the main difference and then instead of using the SFM float I'm going to use the SM uh, vector which is just an alias to this M128 which uh, maps almost one to one to the the when the compiler generated the code to the uh, MMX registers what's interesting here is now what I'm trying to do and if you want to learn more details I there's my article here which will cover all these, these uh, there are many little details but the main thing here when you're trying to write code that will optimize you need to try to code, to code uh, uh, as, as simple as possible so the compiler can catch all these, 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 these optimizations and the, 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 the rule of the thumb here there are a few things when you write SIM instructions you want to avoid the load and stores likewise when you copy memory from CPU to GPU it's slow it's the same thing when you're copying memory from uh, CPU to the, to the MMX register this has a, a performance hit so you want to try to minimize the load float and the, the store float as much as I can and keep all your expression into the SIM register and this will give you the best performance and also here I couldn't do it but we could store the MX as directly as XM vector I didn't do this again because I want to keep it similar to Thomas code but that will even help creating a better code generation because you help having even less loads in stores and those are the, the main thing just you want to try to write simple code very friendly to the compiler and keep your um, that inside the scene registers so now let's uh, compile this code again and let's bring the disassembly and we do the same thing while well, we'll just copy this entire code into my notepad maybe I should just show the code without the C just the disassembly without the C code Hopefully I don't make any mistakes in here, probably won't, but if I make one 
bad cut and paste it won't matter much because the main thing I here I want to show you now that I rewrote the code using the XM vectors and trying to help the compiler as much as I can to generate better code let's see what we've got and I'll put it back here into Excel and that's our new version and then if you look at from some 16 structures it shrunk down to like 48 47 this is a significant difference this probably was not is not like the inner loop at this point but this if you profile and this was your 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 inner loop your bottleneck this would cause a significant performance hit because we're talking about roughly from 61 to like 47 that's uh you know more or less almost 30 percent the code shrunk 30 percent so this is not a small difference it's very 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 uh significant as far as performance goes and these are the things you need to work on as you optimize though when you go and you want to rewrite the verlet is the same thing you can re re rearrange this to use the sm vector and the overload operators or if you want to just call the directly the intrinsics either way will increase the you make the code a lot more and therefore a lot faster in our case in here another thing and then if you look at this loop right it's looping and basically it's just stepping particles adding deltas to these particles this is screaming to me like the to go into the gp gpu program if you use parallelized uh api some like could open uh, cl to utilize the gpu this is very very gpu friendly because what happens uh, inside your gpu card you have all these gpu little cores that they can perform this calculation all in parallel many of them in the way more or less it works you have to look at the api you allocate like small little threads in this case the size uh, as many as your particle system and each one will run in parallel in one of these CUDA cores or the G sorry the GPU cores and that will boost f incredibly the speed and you can try to do this if maybe with direct compute as well but that's like uh, the other idea we're talking about try to parallelize the algorithm itself and this is very uh, GP GPU friendly here so you would allocate all these these cores and each one will be May, doing the the step of one part but they all run in parallel this will really really increase the performance and and you can try to do this with the constraint solver as well this is slightly more complicated because there are dependencies in here so then the algorithm will be more complicated you might want to try to do something like the divide and conquer have to divide the small patch in each gpu core would process them and you try to combine this patch together and that will definitely uh, increase the, the, the performance of the code. Now that we have successfully modeled the cloth with the stick constraints, performed collision detection in response with the static sphere, and saw some optimizations we can do, we can try to expand this idea to other types of uh, soft bodies like spheres, cubes, or even complex uh, shapes. For instance, here in this picture, I can model a sphere by simply using the geometry generated by Blender as the endpoints of the stick constraint. But more precise, this will model the skin of the sphere. However, once the gravity starts upon the object, these points will flatten because these points, the sphere will start colliding with, with the ground. But I can also easily fix this problem by simply adding extra stick constraints starting from the center of the sphere to its skin, as shown here with these lighter uh, lines. And that way we can keep the integrity of the sphere's volume. And furthermore, if I just move the center of the sphere, if I just nudge it, which happens to be the center of mass, the entire system will move because when relaxation kicks in, we will eventually try to find out a solution to keep the integrity of this object and you naturally generate some rotation, like I showed in the first demo when we started this presentation. And we can keep going this idea, we can even apply some extra rotation to the surface points to give a more realistic uh, uh, rotation, not like the super slippery uh, surface. Then you may think we can keep using the same idea to build an entire rigid body engine, meaning modeling everything as an aggregate of particles. 
Unfortunately, not really. First, it will be computationally quite expensive if we go in that direction because you saw how many calculations were involved to resolve all these constraints, not counting collision detection response with many particles. But second, and more importantly, if you go on that route to model full rigid body, things will not work uh, as you expect because it's too difficult to make it truly rigid. There will be always a degree of softness into these objects. The reason for that is that there are two main factors that determine the stiffness of our soft bodies using this algorithm. And here is when the number of the iterations into the relaxation loop. But more importantly, in, in fact, far, we have more far weight into the stiffness is the number of stick constraints you add to keep the body shape. So being those a limiting factor, even if you had an immense computational power to waste, to make your soft body with millions of constraints and, and, and hundreds of iterations just to, to try to keep it completely rigid, you would still see artifacts like the model cracking or being still visibly compressible. So, and for that really, to really truly solve these problems, you really need to go and move on to a full rigid body engine where the objects are treated as solid objects and not an aggregate of particles. In our case, let's go back to that first demo I showed. We had the lighting and the texture mapping in the beginning of presentations, and I wanted to show these issues. Here, I modeled the marble ball with a, as a soft body using the method I just described. The sphere itself had 174 verts, which led to 174 constraints to keep its volume because I used one stick constraint from the center to each vertex of the sphere. Not counting that I also used 493 constraints to keep the skin since the algorithm just used blended geometry to build up the list. These are quite a bit of constraints for a low poly model. In fact, we can get very similar results uh, with far less. However, this is good to show that I made this softball extremely stiff. And now, let me see if I can get to happen some of the problems we discussed. Um, I'll just move the cloth a little bit out of the way. And let me just make a collide with the, with the wall. So yeah, I think you saw it. First, it's, it's kind of soft, a little bit soft, so it doesn't really look like a marble ball. But worse are these cracks, which again is almost inevitable. And this is a very, very stiff model, the way I create these constraints. So see if I can get it to happen again. It's just the position, the sphere is a little bit of velocity. Yeah, there you go. So that you, you see that it, it, it easily cracks. And, and this is because the moment these vertices uh, pass the wall, I project them back to the wall surface. And this object is causing the entire relaxation loop to recalculate all the constraints. And we still get some degree of compressibility on the body and also these visual artifacts, these visual cracks that I just showed. And to solve that problem, we really would have to make these objects a, a full rigid body and use it like a, a rigid body engine, which is a more complex system for the simulation. And there are other issues that I did not discuss too, such as the cross colliding itself, which means you need to resolve, you need to collide and resolve collision with the triangles, all the triangles that compose the cloth, which is a pretty complex problem. See, let me see, let me see if I can show you this too, because obviously when I was demoing this, it's a little bit hard to get it going, but you should be able to see. So I'm trying from the sides. Yeah, I think if you see the the at the edges see these triangles, sometimes they get degenerated because I am not really colliding the cloth with itself. But in our case, to address all these issues is beyond the scope of this tutorial. 
but I just want to show you so that you are aware of them using this type of simulation. Hope you enjoyed this presentation and have learned how to write your cloth as well as many aspects of a physics engine. To close, I want to give you the main reference I used on the screencast and a few words on it. Those were not all I used, but the main ones. First obvious is Jacobson's article, which pretty much we deep dove in one part of it. There's definitely more to it, so I highly encourage you to look at his original paper. You can find it in many places on the web, and I decided to host it here in the repository of this project. Second, and one of the best physics programming books I have read, in my opinion, and it was written by Ian Millington, and it's called Game Physics Engine Development. This is a really, really, really great book, and you must have if you want to learn more about physics programming. Basically, what Milton does, he builds from the ground up a physics engine. So he starts with a mass aggregate one, and then he converts it to a full rigid body. He has source code for the entire project, and all the concepts, even the very complex ones, are really well explained, really in plain uh, language. So definitely check it out. Another good book is the one written by David Eberly, and it's called Game Physics. And he discussed in that rigid body simulation. Yet this book is a, more, a bit more math oriented. There is source code, but it's not as easy to follow as Millington's book. You can also check it out the uh, physics based animation, which is done by multiple authors. But this one is much harder to read because there's only pseudo code and very math oriented. But it covers many aspects of physics programming but more in an academic approach. So if you're not really taking classes with these professors, it, there is definitely more, uh, it's, it's di more difficult to follow the, the book. As of DirectX, I definitely recommend Frank Luna's book, which is an introduction to 3D game programming with DirectX 11. As of right now, it's a bit outdated, mostly because Microsoft has changed quite a bit the application model to conform with tablet and phone development. But Frank, uh, he's coming out with a, a new edition and I'm pretty sure he's going to address all these issues. In all cases, all the 3D math uh, he explains, it's totally up to date as well as how you use DirectX API is still valid. So you can easily convert his sample code to the modern app style. The only main uh, main issue that it's outdated there is like is you, Microsoft used to use these FX files, which basically the vertex shade and the pixel shade all combine in one file. But again, you can just split the code into the vertex and pixel shade, and everything will work just fine. It's not really that difficult to convert. And lastly, those references that I already discussed, the real-time rendering, so it's a must book to have if you want to do 3D uh, graphics programming. And for CMD uh, operations, definitely check out my article, which is still hosted on Gamma Sutra. So it's, I, I'll go and, and explain all the details, how can you write code so that you optimize for the best and help the compiler to optimize the best the code utilizing the parallelism of the vector instructions. The source code for the project will build up throughout this uh, screencast. It's available on this uh, GitHub repository, so you can download and check it out. And if you have questions or comments, you can send me an email, and I'll try to answer to you when I have a chance. Thank you very much for watching.